Broadcasting from the Shepherd Ministry Studios in Scottsdale, Arizona, this is Shepherd Gathers with Pastor Scott Seidler. Hey, Shepherd family, this is Pastor Scott Seidler. Welcome to another episode of Shepherd Gathers. As we go a little bit farther now, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. It's going to be a great run. You know, Shepherd Gathers exists in order to help achieve our shepherd mission of leading people to follow Jesus. Particularly, we do that in this Shepherd Gathers vignette by going deep into certain books of Scripture and uh, plumbing their depths, learning a little bit more not only about the way in which God has moved in history, but also the way that he is seeking to move in our history. Shepherd Gathers is not just about looking into the past, it's about thinking of the present in view of God's mission that he is carrying us forward to achieve in the future. Now, as we've made our way through here, I just want to situate us once again. We're studying the book of Philippians. And what that means is that we are studying a conversation that Paul is having with a congregation that he first met during his second missionary journey. This is all recorded, by the way, in the book of Acts. That second missionary journey taking place in Acts chapters 12, 13, 14, in that range there, um, I'm sorry, in chapters 16, 17, and 18, first missionary journey is in 12, 13, 14, Council of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15, 16, 17, 18, he goes further in toward Macedonia, further into Greece, and he is now starting to connect with really non-Jewish populations. So he's at work here, and Philippi in Macedonia is one of the chief places where Paul found a great warm reception for his ministry. He prizes the relationship that he started in Macedonia, particularly with three very uncommon individuals, at least uncommon as far as Paul was typically working. He met a um, uh, proselytites, proselytites? proselytes, a uh, person named Lydia, who uh, was a dealer in purple, purple cloth. He met a slave girl. He also met a Philippian jailer. All of these three very uncommon characters formed the heart and soul of that Philippian congregation. And it was to them, in particular, as much as to the Philippian congregation generally, that he wrote this letter to Philippi. You know, one of the things I want you to remember as we go through, it's not just reading deep into the text, but it's getting a larger angle view of Scripture, especially the New Testament. Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church from prison. This is the imprisonment that we read about in Rome at the end of Acts chapter 28. We believe that Paul was confident he would be released from this imprisonment, and in fact he was. And then, ultimately, there was a second imprisonment that likely led to Paul's martyrdom. That imprisonment is represented, that second imprisonment, in 2 Timothy. When Paul seems to be writing from a dungeon, he's all by himself. He is very despondent, believing that his time to leave this world and return to God is short at hand, that he's being poured out as a drink offering, 2 Timothy chapter 4. So I just want to put that all into perspective because now we come into the real beginning of this letter to the Philippians. Let's look there at Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to focus on verses 3 through 11, which in the writing of letters forms the conclusion of what is the opening section of most Greek letters. Greek letters have a four-part opening section. The first is the one who's writing, that is, I'm Paul and Timothy, we're writing this letter. The to whom we are writing, this would be the Philippian church. A greeting, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And then finally, a word of thanksgiving, commendation, or affirmation. That's where we find ourselves today in verses 3 through 11. 
And so I just want to read this first verse because, again, so often when we read these opening verses, we kind of just breeze right through them in order to get to what is ultimately the heart and soul, the meat and potatoes of the scripture. Listen in as this first verse from Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 is read for you. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. Again, every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. Now, think about this uh, mantra, okay? If we take a, a life lesson from this, here is the way in which Paul lived his ministry. It's really simple. Are you ready to write this down? Here we go. I think, I thank. Got it? I think, I thank. If you're from the southern United States, you might say, I thank and I thank, right? That's how it works. Whenever Paul thinks of anything, there is a capacity that's been built in him by the Holy Spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ to say, thank you, God. One of the great things about living here in Arizona is that when I'm out and about, especially on golf courses, I get to see all kinds of Arizona wildlife. About a year or so ago, I was on a golf course and there was a mountain lion about, I don't know, 30, 40 yards away from me. I did not say thank you, God, for that mountain lion because I was actually preparing to be eaten alive and go and visit my maker in heaven. However, when I see other kinds of flora and fauna in Arizona, I have been, um, I, I have, I've been building up this capacity to see, oh, there's a roadrunner. Thank you, God, for that roadrunner. There are little um, prairie dogs. Thank you, God for those little prairie dog marmot looking things. There's some javelinas over there, little porky pigs. Thank you, God, for that. Um, that may seem a little bit odd to say, but you know, it is one of those life lessons that I think we pick up on here when I think or see something to automatically be able to say thank you for it. You know, this capacity to say, I think and I think, certainly carries over even more so to even greater things in this world. The human beings with whom we share life, the God that offers us through our callings all manner of opportunity and joy. I think, I think, that's the kind of life I want to live. Here at Shepherd of the Desert, one of the things that I like to do is uh, I like to teach my confirmation kids, the 6th through 8th graders. And as they differentiate from their moms and dads, as they grow up into young adults, one of the things that I love to do with them is to ask them for prayer requests. And as we go around the table and I ask for prayer requests, sometimes what happens is they will say to me, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any prayers. At which point in time, I hit the buzzer, bah! And I say, wrong answer, in a loving pastoral way, of course. And I say to them, um, remember, there is never not a reason to be praying. There is never not a opportunity, an opportunity for prayer that you cannot conjure up. Whenever you are thinking, you have reason to thank, and as we'll learn a little bit later, to pray for even greater. And so that's what I want to challenge you to think about today as Paul um, begins this letter. Let's not overlook that capacity as we think to say thank you. Now, what does Paul say thank you for? Let's read on here uh, verses 4 through 8 and uh, kind of key in on what Paul is particularly thankful for. Uh, we're going to now go from just the capacity for thankfulness into the real heart and soul of a part of Philippians. We're going to start really a Bible study at this point in time. Listen in with me as I read for you from uh, verse uh, 4 through 8. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you. 
for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. What is Paul thankful for as by God's Holy Spirit in prison he thinks of this Philippian church? Let me give you three T's uh, to focus on here. First of all, he says, I thank God for your partnership in the gospel ministry. I want to give you the T that is task. Paul is thankful for the fact that he has someone sharing in the task that he's been called to. You know, I uh, I think of all the times that I work in in the yard with my family when my wife is is doing housework or something like that, or I'm doing housework and she's working out in the yard, whatever the situation is. And when one of my children comes and says, "How can I help? How can I, in other words, share in the task?" There is something very very encouraging about that experience. Even if it's not a big task, it's just someone who's standing shoulder to shoulder with me to do a task. You know, uh, just recently here in America, we celebrated the remembrance of uh, 9-11. And I use those words in a, in a very particular way. We celebrated 9-11, not because it was something to celebrate as an event, but because it showed the resolve and the steel with which first responders went about their tasks, and how we as an American culture came together after terrorism um, greeted us and entered our shores. I think about all the images and pictures of those days after 9-11 when shoulder to shoulder with firefighters and police officers, there were volunteers, there were chaplains, ministers, folks that were side by side with this task of cleaning up the rubble in Shanksville, Tennessee, or Shanksville, Pennsylvania, in New York City, at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., Some of the strength that we experienced in those days after 9-11, in the face of tremendous tragedy and death and needless, senseless violence, was that we were accomplishing a task, a task of rebuilding, rescuing, repairing the fabric of our nation. That shared task, that shared experience is important. Paul it uses this particular Greek word, I thank God for our koinonia in the gospel. This fellowship we have in a common faith in Jesus Christ that allows us to do a common task of mission. Um, with whom do you share the task? The tasks of life. It's something to think about. Paul will go on to say, though, um, you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. I'm certain that God, who began this good work in you, will continue to work it out until the day of Christ Jesus. The second word I want to give you today is uh, tenacity. Task, but tenacity is a word that Paul thanks God for. Um, when he thinks about the Philippians. This Philippian church is tenacious. They are ready to get after it like a dog with a bone in his mouth. They are not willing to give up. They are willing to stay in the fight. If you read there in Acts chapters 16, 17, and 18, you will see that there was a tremendous amount of persecution going on for the Apostle Paul. He had to leave one town and get to another because the risk to his life was that great, and therefore he did not also want that kind of same risk to be visited upon the church unnecessarily because of him. But the Christian church in Philippi from the earliest days of its life with God, his life with Paul, had to be tenacious. I asked the question just a moment ago, who shares a task of life with you? Let me ask you now this question, who shares the tenacity? 
of life with you. If the task and a shared task gives you, in other words, um, a feeling of camaraderie, shared tenacity gives you a feeling of great hope. Paul was grateful for help. We all are grateful for help. But what we are really grateful for is hope. Help that leads to hope is really, really helpful, isn't it? The Philippian church was tenacious. They were ready to stick in the fight until Christ Jesus came. And that could be a long way, as we know, a long way off. Uh, There's a third T, though, that I want to focus on here. And that is tender compassion. Um, The thing that Paul has for the Philippians that uh, sometimes doesn't come out in other epistles like 1 Corinthians, maybe even 2 Corinthians. Galatians has no tender compassion from the Apostle Paul, at least not tender compassion as we follow it up. But this third T of tender compassion that Paul is thankful for, he looks at the Philippian church and their shared task, their shared tenacity, and he says, gosh, I love you guys. I just love you with all my heart. I love to hang out with you. I love when you send me a gift. I love when you send me a human being that encourages me. I just love everything about you. I love the time that I spent with you. I love the time that I'm going to get to spend with you after I get out of this awful Roman imprisonment in which I find myself right now and for which, as I mentioned earlier, we believe Paul was ultimately vindicated of the charges against him before the emperor and was released. End of Acts chapter 29, so to speak. Paul looked forward and we believe that he went and in fact saw the Philippians after he wrote this letter. So task, tenacity, and tender compassion, that's what leads Paul through. Now in this set of verses here, uh, uh, verses 4 through 8, there is one particular phrase that comes out. Many of us have this verse written on a a, a Hobby Lobby plaque that we've gotten for $4.99. It's a magnet on our refrigerator. Maybe for some of you it was a confirmation verse when you were a teenager and you were confirmed in the Christian faith. Maybe not yours, but something that you heard. Uh, Verse 6, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will, will continue his work until it is finally finished in the day of Christ Jesus. Verse 6 from Philippians. Now, typically what we do with that verse, let's go into that verse a little bit. Typically what we do with that verse is personalize it and sentimentalize it. Um, that is that God who began a good work of faith in me When I was a child and I was baptized, when I was a teenager and I was confirmed, when I was an adult and came to find Jesus, when I was in the worst parts of life, I remembered this verse and I personalized it. I said, well, what God has begun in me, I will make it through this rough patch. As we'll read a little bit later in chapter 3, verse 14, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right. Personal and sentimental. It makes me feel warm. It gives me confidence that this God who, like Paul, is tender-hearted, or Paul, like God, is tender-hearted, that that tender heart prevails in me today as I face down all manner of conflict and confrontational circumstance. Brothers and sisters, I want you to remember this truth, that you can always personalize and sentimentalize passages of Scripture. Because this thing is true. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He wants you to be with him. He has given you his Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. All of that is personally true of you and has great sentimental value. It makes us feel warm, loved, remembered, comforted. But when we do the work of interpreting Scripture and reading Scripture, we always want to make sure that we don't personalize and sentimentalize the Scripture unless we have reason to do so. In this case, that verse from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, um, that God will carry on to completion the good work that He began in us, is actually not personal and sentimental. It is universal. It is organizational. And most importantly, it is missional. 
Paul thanks God for the shared partnership for the task tenaciously accomplished in view of the tender mercy of God. Paul is thankful that God will continue to carry out that mission that he shares with the Philippians to the end of time. Whether he makes it out of prison or not, the mission continues. Whether the Philippians fail or not, the mission continues. Everything else can fall to pieces. But Paul knows that the good work of mission that God began in him early on in Macedonia with the Philippians, his greatest confidence while in prison is that this mission will never fail that God will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. And that means that the Philippians can know that the mission of God toward them will continue. Paul's mission that has been pushing slowly, patiently toward the West, through Macedonia, through Greece, over to the boot of Italy, that will continue as well. God's worldwide purpose will continue. And so the upshot of this as we're reading it is, how do we thank God, not just for stuff that we've got, people that we meet, life that we live, gains that we make, how do we thank God for the way the mission is moving in, around, and through us as believers in Jesus Christ? That's the million-dollar question. And in view of this, I think, I think, how do we participate in that mission? All right, you ready to finish up here? We've got 9, 10, and 11 uh, to go. Let me read that for you here. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation that is, the righteous character produced in your life by Christ Jesus. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. I want you to uh, think about this truth, that as we think and thank God for all that He's done, that we pray for greater. If I could add to the mantra that I taught you to uh, maybe think of this verse or remember these verses with, I think, I think, I pray for greater yet. I think, I think, I pray for greater yet or still. That's the mantra that really encapsulates the message of Philippians chapter 1, 3 through 11. Paul prays that the Philippians will overflow in love, that their faithfulness will continue until the day of Christ Jesus, that they would grow continually in blamelessness, in purity. This idea that there are greater things that are coming, more is coming into the future. God never, ever is satisfied with our lives in this world. We never have enough God in us. We always have sufficient forgiveness, sufficient mercy and grace to take us across the finish line of heaven. That is never in order. Faith as small as a mustard seed, deek. faith as small as a mustard seed, that prevails before our God and Heavenly Father. But nevertheless, while we live this human life, there is always the truth. There is more, greater, yet still to be done. So when Paul thinks, he says, thank you. And when he says, thank you, he prays for greater yet, more still. That's what Paul does. That's how a Christian lives. And now you have, I think, your marching orders for the next week. Over the next seven days, you've been reading Philippians. Hopefully now you've read it about 14 times. Keep on reading it. But now over the next seven days, put into practice that mantra, I think, I thank, I pray for more. I pray for greater. Do that. Journal that. 
Let me know how you're doing. Shepherd Gathers at shepherdaz.church. Love to hear from you. Let me know again what are the passages from Philippians that really stick out for you. If you've got questions, if there's something that I kind of skim or skip over, please let me know. Glad to answer and interact with you. Take a phone call, write me. Be glad to set up a time for Zoom. Lots of different ways to get in touch. I don't want to just be a pastor on a screen. I want to be a pastor for you in real time. And so don't hesitate to reach out to me for that very purpose. Remember that Shepherd Gathers is part of our digital ministry. At the bottom of the screen, there are options to give uh, financial support to Shepherd. As we make our way through to the end of, year, uh, of the year, this 2021 year, your financial support does make a difference to the strength and solvency of our ministry so that programs like Shepherd Gathers here online, programs in person that we have here in Scottsdale can continue. Again, want to be that kind of congregational support for you. Well, thanks again for listening. Next week, next time, we will launch into the body of the letter. We've now finished the four main parts of the letter's opening. And now we're going to go into the body of the letter. We're going to read the initial exhortation. What does Paul actually want to accomplish as he's writing the Philippians? Start reading again there at verse 12 of chapter 1, and we're going to continue to make our way forward. I'm Pastor Scott Seidler. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining in. Keep on reading, Shepherd family. We'll see you again next week.